All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Faith Robertson. I'm a neurosurgery resident at Mass General and part of the uh, World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies Young Neurosurgeons Forum. This is a webinar series that we've been doing on landmark papers in neurosurgery. And many of them have focused on key randomized control trials that have um, really influenced kind of how we think about uh, surgical, surgical delivery in our field. Uh, today, we have the privilege of speaking with uh, Peter Forst uh, coming to us from Sweden. And he'll be talking about uh, a publication that they uh, established in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016 about the role of fusion in surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, Dr. Force is, um, he got his MD PhD at Uppsala University, uh, where he currently is the head of the spine surgery unit in the Department of Orthopedics. And uh, Dr. Force, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone that you uh, spend a part of your Sunday uh, listening to me uh, when I will give this talk about the role of fusion in surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis. Sorry, I'm trying to go on with the presentation. Some disclosures. Uh, well, the content of this talk will be, the bulk will be about our publication from the Swedish spinal stenosis study, but uh, you can't uh, talk about the role of fusion without mentioning uh, a couple of other studies. An American study, the SLIP trial by Suhar Gogawala published in the same issue as our paper of New England Journal of Medicine and also a more recent study from Norway, the Nord CM DS study. And I will also talk a bit about the concept of instability. So this is the paper we had uh, in 2016 in New England Journal of Medicine. It's all about the Swedish spinal stenosis study, which uh, was a multi-center RCT comparing decompression to decompression with uh, fusion. 247 patients were included between 2006 and 2012. All had a lumbar spinal stenosis on one or two levels with or without degenerative spondylolisthesis. And the main follow-up was two years, but now I will present the five-year follow-up uh, as well. The primary outcome measure was the Oswald Street Disability Index, I don't know if you're acquainted to that. It's the most common patient-reported outcome measure in lumbar spinal problems. Here are some of the most important inclusions and exclusion criteria. The age were between 50 and 80. All had surgical education in one or both legs and the a degree of back pain corresponding to at least 30 on the 100 degrees VAS scale. MRI with a spinal stenosis on one or two segments between L2 and sacrum, and duration of symptoms at least six months. Of course, an informed consent. Exclusion criteria were spondylolysis, the degenerative conditions, history of prior surgery for spinal stenosis or uh, instability. They could have been operated for a lumbar disc herniation. Or stenosis not caused by degenerative changes. Here's a flow chart of the, the study. 247 patients were randomized. We had some dropouts before treatment, that is before surgery, and ended up with uh, 233 patients operated within the study. After two years, we had uh, in total five patients lost to follow up for dif from different reasons, as you can see here. But we ended up with a, a 
follow up rate of 97% after two years. And after five years, we had some more loss to follow up, but a follow up rate of 91%. We did a computerized randomization to either decompression with concomitant fusion or decompression alone. We did a stratification for the existence of degenerative spondylolisthesis of at least three millimeters on preoperative plane X-ray. So this created a, like a subgroup within the study of 135 patients, all with a degenerative spondylolisthesis uh, with a mean slip of 7.4 millimeters. And as we did this. Uh, uh, stratification, you can consider it like a, like a separate RCT within the study of 135 patients. Some baseline data, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I don't, I want, I don't want to go into it in detail. It just shows that the randomization process succeeded in creating comparable treatment groups. Here are the data for the whole study group, all patients, but also for the subgroup with the degenerative spondylolisthesis. The type of surgery performed, it was, according to the protocol, it was up to the surgeon to choose the method, the method of decompression or the method of, of fusion. And this ended up with 82% uh, of the decompressions were done with the central decompression uh, or laminectomy and 18% with bilateral laminotomies. In the surgery group, 90% were operated with uh, instrumented posterolateral fusion, 6% had an uh, interbody fusion and 4% had an uninstrumented fusion. The study was powered to detect differences in the Oswestry Disability Index of 12 units and on the uh, VAS scale for pain, at least 20 units. So results, not surprisingly, there were significant differences in the duration of surgery and the amount of bleeding, of course, in favor of, of the decompression group. More results here also for the whole study group in the first column and uh, the subgroup with degenerative spondylolisthesis in the second column. As you can see, there's no difference between the two treatments and there was a significant improvement for all outcome measures, but uh, no differences between the two treatments. One interesting point is that we did an uh, objective walking test on all patients, the six minutes walk test described in the 80s. It's a very simple, inexpensive and safe test. The patient walk a course of 25 meters back and forth for six minutes. And uh, as you can see preoperatively, they walked a bit more than 300 meters. And after two years after the treatment, uh, around 80 meters longer with, with no differences between the two treatment groups. Decompression is D and decompression and fusion is DF. We also did a health, health uh, study of the health economy in the study for the first two years. Of course, there were uh, longer stay in the hospital in the fusion groups. We had quite long hospital stays in those days. Nowadays, there are less than half of this. The operation costs were, were more expensive in the fusion group, not surprisingly. Uh, there were around 7,000 more expensive with a fusion compared to a decompression. But uh, regarding other follow-up uh, resource use. There were no differences between the two treatment groups. There's a 
another illustration of the Oswestry Disability Index preoperatively and a significant improvement in both treatment groups, but overlapping confidence intervals and thus no significant difference. Also regarding pain, and this is of course interesting, uh, about 20 years ago when we planned this study, there was a general thought that uh, decompression didn't, uh, help, didn't help for back pain in uh, spinal stenosis, but now we know better from many studies. And this was the results from our study. A significant improvement in back pain from preoperatively to after two years, but no differences between the two treatments. DO is decompression only and DF is decompression with the fusion. And also regarding back pain, also regarding leg pain, no differences. We also digged into subgroups to, to look if there could be any subgroup that benefited from a fusion. The rest of my talk now will be mostly on the subgroup with degenerative spondylolisthesis. As uh, I, I would say there's no, no, no controversies about spinal stenosis without degenerative spondylolisthesis, uh, whether to use fusion or not. I think uh, most surgeons are agree that uh, a simple decompression is, is enough, but that was not the case about 20 years ago when we started planning the study. There were some thoughts that uh, all patients with stenosis benefited from fusion. But the conflict is now about patients with uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis. So this is a patient with degenerative spondylolisthesis with a slip more than the mean slip of 7.4 millimeters, as large as uh, up to 14 millimeters. And as you can see, also in this subgroup, there were no benefit with fusion. We also looked at those patients with most back pain, that is a back pain more than a mean back pain of 68 units on the VAR scale. Also here, no differences between uh, the two groups. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's closely to significant regarding the p-value, but uh, if you look at the the numbers, uh, they talk in the benefit for the decompression group, but no significant differences. We also divided uh, the patients into age groups, those the younger patients and the older patients. Also here with no differences and no benefit with fusion. We also looked into one level cases and two level cases. And that's important to, to, to mention. Uh, if the patient had stenosis on two levels, both levels were treated according to the randomization. So both levels uh, were fused or decompression only. Now we go on with the results up to five years. This is an illustration about the Oswestry Disability Index, the ODI. As you can see, a significant improvement and the results maintain for up to five years, but with no differences between the two treatments. This is the five years results with 91% follow-up. Uh, in the, the subgroup with degenerative spondylolisthesis. And as you can see, no significant differences between the two treatment groups when you look at the absolute values, and, but also when you look at uh, uh, difference from baseline. Some ordinal data, uh, almost 60% of the patients reported improved walking ability and this is five years after the surgery. 
with no differences between the two groups. Uh, almost 70% were satisfied with the result and 80% reported improvement in both back pain and leg pain. Regarding subsequent lumbar surgery, and then we, we count both a, a true reoperation on the operated level, but also any new surgery in the lumbar spine. So you can see about 24 and 25% had had a second surgery in the lumbar spine after five years. And here you can see a survival curve, a couple of mile curve uh, regarding subsequent surgery. So the two treatment groups follow each other. Uh, the decompression group had some earlier uh, secondary surgeries, but uh, on the whole, they follow each other for the five years. And the most common reasons for subsequent surgery within five years in the two treatment groups were after decompression, it was re-stenosis or foramenal stenosis on the index level, 16% of all patients and 7% 7, 7 had a surgery for adjacent segment stenosis. In the fusion group, the clearly most common reason was adjacent segment stenosis. And the reason for this, you can see here, we did an MRI on all on most of the patients up to two years. Here is the subgroup without degenerative spondylolisthesis and the subgroup with degenerative spondylolisthesis, the compression and the compression with effusion. And we looked for adjacent level stenosis and recurrent, that is same level stenosis at the operated level. And you can see that it's clearly much more common with the adjacent level stenosis in the fusion group. And that recurrent same level stenosis is not uh, a big problem, as you can see, for, for all subgroups, at least not after two years. But this is only uh, radiological findings. It's not. Uh, it might not be clinically present. And uh, in summary, among all patients, 23% of the decompression and 40% of the decompression infusion had a new stenosis on an MRI after two years. When you look at, at this and compare to, to other studies, like from the sport study, uh, Almost 20% had a reoperation of the eight years without difference between decompression and decompression infusion. And also a large cohort of 25,000 patients with 11 years follow up. Almost yeah, around 20% had had a, a new surgery with, uh, without difference between decompression and decompression infusion. And uh, this third study is our study. It has been not been published yet, it's submitted. Within the whole material, 23% new surgeries after decompression and 24% after fusion. So this is very important to, to notice and to inform patients that due to the progression of degenerative changes, one out of five patients who have been operated for spinal stenosis will have will have subsequent lumbar surgery within five to ten years. This regardless of if they had a decompression or a fusion as an index surgery. Well now I leave our study, the Swedish spinal stenosis study, and go on with the other two studies I will shortly mention. This study by so Gogawala was published in the same issue as our study, the SLIP trial. And it's, it has been considered as with conflicting results compared to our study. And I would say it's not that conflicting. Uh, also, this study don't show any substantial benefit from fusion. 
we look into the data of this study, 66 patients, uh, follow-up rates of 86% after two years, and after four years, every third patients were lost to follow-up. And also an important issue is that 12 patients, that is uh, one third of the patients in the decompression group, crossed over to fusion, and that makes uh, the data difficult to, to evaluate. The primary outcome measure in this study was uh, the improvement of SF36 physical component summary. And for this outcome measure, the results were in favor of fusion. Uh, and it was a significant improvement. And the difference in improvement uh, was 5.7 where the uh, minimal clinical important difference is five. So as you can see, barely, sign barely uh, significant difference and barely clinically relevant. But in a, there were no differences in, uh, in changes from baseline for any other outcome measure. And uh, regarding absolute values at follow-up, no differences in any outcome measure even the SF36 physical component summary. But what differed was uh, the reoperation re rate. That was 14% in the fusion group and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, and 34% in the decompression group. And this is a high number. It has not been shown in any other study. And when you look at, at the difference uh, regarding SF36 uh, physical component summary, it corresponds to a number needed to treat of seven. That means that you need to fuse seven patients to have a, a better results compared to if you had a, done a decompression on all the patients. So not, I would say not a substantial benefit with fusion also in this study. And if we go further to uh, my neighbor, neighboring country, Norway, uh, this publication uh, was published one year ago. It's a very good study, uh, 267 patients, all with, uh, with spinal stenosis, with degenerative spondylolisthesis, with a mean slip, also here, of exactly the same as in our study, 7.4 millimeters. 134 patients had decompression alone and 133 had effusion. Interesting in this study is that they did flexion extension on all patients at baseline, where they found a, a difference of more than three millimeters on 20% of the participants. And regardless of that, there were no benefit from fusion. 90% uh, follow-up after two years. And uh, here are the results. Uh, as you can see, the primary outcome measure was the proportion of patients reaching a 30% reduction of the ODI. And in an intention to treat analysis, this was reached by 71% of the decompression and 73% of the fusion with no significant difference. And the, the per protocol analysis uh, the fraction was the same in both groups. There were no difference in any patient reported outcome measure. And no differences in complication rates except for dural tears. Also no difference in subsequent lumbar surgeries within, within these two years. Illustration uh, of the Oswestry uh, Disability Index in the, their study, very similar to our study. And also for back pain and leg pain. So next topic I would like to talk about is is this uh, concept of instability. Is instability really a problem? 
after the <clears throat> after the compression. Sorry. There are <clears throat> there are some uh, anatomical factors that has been discussed through decades, like the disc height, like the orientation of the facet joints, and also fluid in the facet joints, deformity, of course, and, uh, and most importantly, degenerative spondylolisthesis. There's also surgical issues, like whether or not the midline structures could be resected, and uh, how, how much of the facet joints that can be resected. Regarding that question about the midline structures, I would just like to mention that there are now several studies showing no benefit with the preservation of the midline structures compared to the central decompression or laminectomy. Of course, the laminectomy nowadays is not as open at it as it used to be when the technique was developed, I mean, several decades ago, you can now do a central decompression with, in a minimally invasive fashion. So there's a Norwegian study uh, published in the British Medical Journal and also Cochrane Review on this issue. And our group published a paper with uh, data from our Swedish spine register last year, also without benefit to the preservation of the midline structures. So, but what remains an issue is degenerative spondylolisthesis. And uh, as uh, we know, uh, as especially in the US, this has been an indication for fusion. And at least some years ago, more than 90% of patients with stenosis with an olisthesis were operated with a fusion. And in Sweden, uh, 10 years ago, uh, about 50% of these patients were operated with a fusion, according to our register, Swiss Bank. And this treatment tradition was to a large extent based on two publications from the early 90s. The paper by Herkowitz and Kultz, and also the paper by Breedwell. But none of these paper were, none of these studies were truly randomized and not solely with patient reported outcome measures. Another problem is that the inclusion was based mainly on flexion extension x rays. I will come back to, to that. And here are some curves about the number of fusion surgeries per 100,000 inhabitants. The US numbers in the upper line and the situation in Sweden below. As you can see, fusion surgery are about seven times more common in the US compared to Sweden. And the, at least the whole of Scandinavia, I would say. So regarding uh, flexion and extension x-rays of the lumbar spine, that's very common. Uh, and uh, many surgeons consider a um, uh, pathological, what they call pathological movement on this examination as a finding that might indicate that the patient should have a fusion. But the problem is that there are measurement errors of up to four millimeters. That, that is, it exceeds uh, the, the number or the, the number of three millimeters that many surgeons consider as a pathological finding. And there's no general agreement on the range of surgical movements on, on lumbar spines and healthy subjects. So there's no, no clear uh, definition on what is pathological or is it painful or yes, does it really matter? The repeatability of the examination is low and it has been shown that there's a risk of serious errors in the classification unless there's uh, uh, large translations. And one paper that has fueled this uh, 
concept of instability is this paper from the sport study, which defined degenerative spondylolisthesis as a specific diagnosis based, uh, based on the different treatment compared to stenosis without degenerative spondylolisthesis. And there were minor differences in preoperative characteristics, including disability and pain. And the similarity between uh, lumbar stenosis patients with and without uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis has been shown in a number of studies. So also in Sweden for decades, there has been a tradition to regard degenerative spinal problems, including spinal stenosis as a result of instability. But the scientific base for this has been uh, quite weak. And this has influenced the treatment tradition also in our country but fusion rates are now declining. And as you can see here um, in this table in 2011, from all decompression surgeries, 37% were done with a fusion. And now the last years, it's 8%. And this has not been followed with an impairment of the results in our register, Swiss Bank and also not with an increase in, uh, in reoperations or subsequent lumbar surgeries. And it's not only these three studies I mentioned that, uh, uh, don't, don't, that doesn't point to uh, benefit from a fusion. There are several studies the last decade without benefit from fusion. And I can mention one of the first studies on this was uh, this last study published from our group with the data from our Swedish register that were very similar to, to all the results in our randomized study. But it's not only the issue that uh, there's no benefit with fusion, and we know now that it's more costly, costly, but it's also uh, with more complications. Not necessarily when you look at smaller studies like the studies I mentioned with uh, some hundred patients, but when you look at larger cohorts, there is uh, a difference. This excellent study by Richard Deyu uh, with a large cohort of 32,000 patients showed that there were a double risk for life-threatening complications with the fusion compared to decompression. Also, rehospitalization re-hospitaliza was higher, and of course, uh, hospital uh, charges. So, conclusions from this. In uh, stenosis surgery, with or without olisthesis, the most important factor for the outcome is uh, appropriate decompression of the neural structures. And degenerative spondylolisthesis has a minor impact on both the symptoms before surgery and the postoperative outcome. And uh, I would say that uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis, the role of degenerative spondylolisthesis has been overrated. And if you consider the risk for complications, societal costs, and the lack of superior results with fusion, a pure decompression should be the primary treatment in the majority of patients. But of course, there are cases that need a fusion, like if you have uh, spinal deformities. And in a case like this, you might end up uh, with a need of a large fusion surgery, and that might be in an old frail patient, this might be too much. So you might end up with a continued non-surgical treatment. But for the normal stenosis patient with or without degenerative spondylolisthesis, if the patients have a foramenal stenosis with associated rhizopathic pain, then I don't, I don't mean uh, uh, just a radiological finding of a foraminal stenosis, 
but a real corresponding uh, vitropathic pain and not the normal cellular claudication. This is for me uh, an indication for fusion because it's difficult to decompress the neural foramen without removing the facet joint. And then of course you need to do a fusion. And this is the case in, in uh, some patient with a degenerative scoliosis and also in patient with a degenerative uh, scoliosis. Finally, I would like to mention some upcoming interesting studies on, in lumbar spinal stenosis. From Norway, this Nordsten study group, it's not only the study I showed you, they are doing several studies on spinal stenosis. They're comparing uh, decompression methods. They're doing studies on uh, imaging. Uh, a lot of things will come out of this uh, group. And from Australia, there's a very interesting ongoing study uh, comparing decompression to placebo surgery, that it, the, they do a, a placebo decompression. They uh, do a surgery all the way into the, to, into the spine, but they stop there and don't do the decompression. They will include 160 patients in this study. They have ethical approval for this. And according to registers, uh, um, it's an ongoing study. And in Sweden, we have, uh, in my group, the Upstein trial, Uppsala spinal stenosis study, where we compare decompression to training. In this study, we want to examine the effect of decompression regarding clinical outcome for the patient symptoms, but also uh, the neuro neurologic function and the sagittal, sagittal balance of the spine. So we do neurophysiologic examinations and we do a full lateral standing x-rays in the study. 150 patients have been included. We operated the last patient last month. Half of the patient do training on a stationary bike for at least 30 minutes, three times a week for four months. And the other half are operated with a decompression with a standard postoperative rehabilitation. And after six months, we do the full, full data, data collection again. And after that, the patients have a the patients in the training group have an opportunity to do a crossover to the, the surgery group. And we will have follow-ups at one, two, and five years. And we'll have first results within a year. Hope to publish it then. So thank you very much. That was what I had to show you this Sunday. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Dr. Forst. Um, for participants that are online, you can submit questions on the Q&A and we'll allow you to speak. Um, but I, I want to, I have a few questions myself to get us started. One, um, you know, kind of zooming out a little bit, you know, this, the study itself, the uh, SSSS study, I mean, it's a huge effort. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how did you design the study? Um, did you kind of like how, what team members were part of the design? How did you, I know like for the OD, ODI, you decided to use 12 as a number as more conservative. The FDA uh, had talked about 15 as a significant one for fusion, but then in comments after the, the publication, there was a question of this study and other studies using more, uh, even lower numbers. So um, and like, did you submit your protocol to the New England Journal beforehand to get their thoughts on it, to see if they'd be interested in the study, make modifications? What all went into the planning of the study? Well, for your first question, uh, this was uh, a long process to design this study. And uh, it came out from a study group, uh, 
study group with uh, spine surgeons working with our spine register, the Swiss spine, that has been in, in place for, since uh, the early 90s. And this study group started with a study on uh, chronic low back pain, comparing uh, fusion surgery to non-surgical treatments. And after that was finished, the, the group were, were thinking about the next step. And the next issue was uh, spinal stenosis cases. And the cases were rising uh, because of the, the, the older uh, patients in our society is increasing. So it, it became a more, more and more of a problem. And uh, in those days, uh, there were issues about uh, fusions. Some surgeons thought that a fusion benefited almost all patients with spinal stenosis, but there were no, no, no uh, evidence for that. Were only these studies I mentioned from, uh, from Herkowitz uh, and Bridwell that were quite old even uh, in those days and with uh, small numbers of patients. But it, it was a long process uh, and uh, regarding the choice of uh, primary outcome measure, the ODI, we looked into several publications and I mean it's a balance to, to choose the, uh, the, the rate of what you should have as a minimally clinically important difference. Um, and uh, we did not uh, send the protocol to the New England Journal before we, we submitted uh, our paper. We submitted the paper uh, and uh, Actually, uh, we had it back, uh, and we had uh, we answered some questions and we submitted it. And uh, for some, uh, yeah, I guess almost at the same time, the tr the slip trial had been submitted to New England Journal of Medicine, and I guess that uh, benefited us both, both our try our study and also the sleep trial. So then New England Journal of Medicine had two trials on the same topic. And uh, that's the case in, in, uh, in many issues of uh, the paper. They have not only one study, uh, but two or, or more on the same topic. So I think that benefited our, both of us. You, you mentioned the um... Uh, so the decline in fusions that's been happening in Sweden. Um, given that, or for, do you think some of that as a result of this study? Yes, I think uh, that decline, though, had started before uh, this study was published. It started uh, around 2011. Or 12, where we had some preliminary results, and we had also, as I mentioned, results from registered studies, several registered studies on the same topic. So it had already started to decline. Um, and and uh, this study on, only, uh, yeah concluded the results from, uh, from other registered studies. All right. Um, Ignatius Asene is on the line and he'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. My question concerns the, um, the practical uh, application of randomization in our city. So how did you do it practically? For example, after randomizing with the, with the computer program, how did you deal with it during the informed consent form? Uh, during the, consent, uh, the informed consent to the patients, did they find it sometimes difficult for patients to accept going to one arm of the treatment or not? Sorry, I didn't actually hear everything you said, but I, I think you asked about the randomization process and if it yes. was difficult, if some patients uh, uh, didn't approve to, to participate, was that the question? 
Yes, how do you, because you said the randomization was done using the computer program. So yeah. once it's done, uh -huh. how then do you apply it maybe to the surgeon who is going to, uh, to do the surgery? Because you need to explain to the patient the procedure during the informed consent. Yeah. Uh, the most common way was that we had a patient uh, in front of us. We discussed uh, the study. We, we explained the two treatment groups and it's it's always much more easy to to have informed consent in a study where there's two surgical options and most patients at least in sweden they don't have uh, an uh, own, own strong opinion on the, which surgical treatment that is the best they uh, rely on, on on the healthcare system and if, if you as a doctor explain that we don't know which method, we thought these two methods is the best, most of the patient accept that and uh, most of the patient join the, the study. And uh, when we had a patient uh, uh, and they wanted to participate, we did a phone call to, a cent to one of these seven centers where they had a research nurse, nurse with, a, with the web-based randomization program and uh, there the one randomization was done and you had a result immediately and could uh, explain uh, and give the result to the patient. Thank you. I was surprised to see um, in your allusion to future studies, the Australian sham surgery, essentially. Um, can you comment on, on your thoughts on that, given that there's been so much literature on the benefit of decompression. Yeah, uh, well, it's a very interesting study. And of course, the, the issue is that there's always, when you have a, a surgical treatment, there's always a placebo effect in every surgical procedure. And it, it has been explained to be a, as much as about 30% of the treatment effect uh, that could be uh, because of the placebo effect and only the rest from the actual uh, surgery. So then it's of course very interesting to do this study. And if, it's, if it can be done in the proper manner that is blinded for the patient, uh, it will be a, a very interesting study, but but real hard to to um, to do, I would say. And it would be very difficult in Sweden, at least, to have ethical approval for such a study. Given given the difference in in payment models and and reimbursement. Uh, do you think that places like the United States will, like with this research, it'll just take a longer time to see a decrease in fusions? Or what are your, what are your thoughts in terms of different reimbursement models for fusion versus decompression? Well, I guess uh, the evidence uh, will also go down into payers in, in the US, if they're governmental or, or insurance companies. And at least, and now with this Norwegian study, I mean, there's, it, there should be not much hesitations about uh, the results. For the majority of patients, the evidence now is that uh, a simple decompression is uh, enough and there's no benefit with the fusion. And I guess it will influence the treatment also in the US within uh, some years. Do we have any other questions for those online?
All right. Well, Dr. Uh, Forrest, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure to see you know, all that you've accomplished and are, are continuing to pursue and kind of the breadth of, of the research ongoing in this field. So thank you so much for, for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, everyone, for listening and spending a part of, <clears throat> part of Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.